like to introduce our guest speaker for our program tonight, Dr. David Connolly. He currently serves as the assistant professor in the Anthropology and History Department on the UNG Dahlonega campus. He teaches classes in U.S. history, Georgia history, antebellum or Old South, and legal history. His background is uh, he's got a bachelor's degree in experimental psychology from Presbyterian College in 1976. He received his Juris Doctor, I like that, law degree from Mercer University in 1980, got his master's in U.S. history from the University of Georgia in 2000, and got his doctorate in U.S. history with an emphasis on Southern history, colonial America, and Caribbean history from Rice University in 2008. And publications, he's written numerous book reviews and articles associated with the United States uh, Southern law and legal history. Work experience, he's been a law clerk for the Honorable William R. Killian, Superior Courts in Brunswick Judicial Court from 1980 to 81, a law clerk for the Honorable Dudley H. Bowen, Jr. from the United States District Court for the Southern District of Georgia from 1981 to 83. He's had a private law practice in Georgia and South Carolina from 83 to 2000. And he's also been a faculty lecturer for the Georgia College and State University in Milledgeville from 2007 until 2012 before, I guess, you relocated up here to Dahlonega. And uh, personal information is that he's a member of the Historical Society, where he serves as our Vice President, the Georgia Historical Society, Southern Historical Association, Georgia Association of Historians, Georgia Legal History Foundation, Society for Historians of the Early Republic, and the American Society for Legal History. Did I forget anything? <laughs> Probably. Probably that's what I mean. So, yeah, I think he knows what he's talking about. So tonight, Dr. Connolly is going to entertain and inform us about some of his ongoing research which has been going on at the courthouse about some of our early law and society here in Lumpkin County. So without any further introduction, Dr. David Connolly. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all tonight um, because this project that I'm engaged in, this what I call the Lumpkin County Legal Records Project, is become very near and dear, something that I started back in uh, last summer. In fact, I think these involve some of these records that uh, Madeline Anthony rescued. There's some half dozen, well, no, more like a dozen at least, banker boxes, yay big, containing literally thousands of, of 19th century Lumpkin County legal and government records that sort of jam sort of jammed in there a little bit, you can, I got, here's two examples up there. And so right now what I've been doing is working closely with Rita Harkins, the clerk of court, of Superior Court, who's been very cooperative and very great assistance, going through these boxes essentially to organize them um, and put them in some sort of order such as year, cause of action, things such as that. I mean, the type of documents we have in there are pleadings, five phase, bond appearances, you know, bond, um, uh, bail bonds, uh, just a host of items, but plus the odd bit of document that sort of got mixed in there. And what is so wonderful about these is these start with the 1832 and sometimes even earlier and go through the 19th century. It is rare in many cases to find a, a county that has fairly intact legal records, uh, particularly from its founding. You may recall down in Hancock County recently they had a huge fire at their courthouse. We've learned that a number of the documents were preserved thanks to the um, bindings of the um, docket books. But it really is rare, too many fires, you know, destruction during the uh, late unpleasantness and things like that have left a lot of counties here to three containing huge gaps. But so far, it seems we're coming across a lot of information in these boxes that I'm going through over in the um, courthouse. Ultimately, what my goal is, is to digitize all these records, to organize them in a, in a way that you know, makes sense, and then to digitize them and post them on the web as a searchable database. Because frankly, these... Um, these records are incredibly um, fragile, as you might imagine. This is sort of a typical condition that you run across. Some are actually in very good shape, but there are a number that are, you know, very, very fragile. 
Now, historians and other people have gone in the past to research in these records. One of my colleagues, Jennifer Smith, had done this. But because they're not organized in any sort of logical, coherent fashion, you know, you just have to thumb literally through these um, documents. Well, that damages them. So in what is essentially a multi-year project, my goal is, I would say, to digitize them so people can search online and look at digital images. I won't be able to transcribe them, unfortunately. But look at these images and without actually having to handle them, thereby preserving uh, the original records for whatever use may be, um, they may be put to. I've been very fortunate. I've gotten a $7,000 grant from the university to um, retain a student worker and to also purchase archival quality supplies, file folders, uh, things such as that. So to begin slowly putting these records, um, uh, so conserving these sort of records. And I have a, this student worker who I thought it was going to be here tonight will, is also an interning with me this semester. So together we will have an opportunity to go through a lot of these boxes what happens is, in many cases, a box might say the records are from the 1850s, but you're going to find documents from the 1830s, 1860s, all in there. So we're separating them all out now by year and by cause of, general cause of action, civil versus criminal versus miscellaneous versus probate, these sort of things. And then we'll go back and even break it down further. This uh, semester and summer, we hope to create a sort of a demonstration project, a database um, or at least finding a dealing with uh, the court cases that address slavery um, in um, the county. So it's a very exciting project. It's a lot of fun. It's slow, sometimes very tedious work. But you know what? Sometimes you just find the neatest things when just by looking on the back of a sheet of paper. So I want to talk about some of the things that I'm seeing and give you some preliminary observations about the sort of evolution of Lumpkin County society in the 1830s, beginning in sort of a boom era, and slowly starting to move into you know, showing signs of maturity and developing stability. But it is also a story of conflict. It's a story of conflict and friction between different classes of people that are in this county all at the same time, with different values, with different goals, with different you know, um, customs. Uh, and we see this often reflected in these court cases that, um, I, you know, that we get to um, examine in these um, boxes. Uh, it is also, uh, these, are, these are great records also to illustrate, you know, a lot of things about this county. Um, a lot of things we'll talk about tonight are very common knowledge, no great revelations. But at the same time, you may find that they provide a slight twist. They provide a great little window on how the society is evolving and how, in fact, um, it is operating. So let's just sort of go right on into it. And let me start off with some observations about the society and the social institutions that are being put into place. Of course, the gold rush and the Cherokee removal are two of some of the iconic, you know, events uh, for this county. And we think largely the miners, we think of the gold industry, we think of the mint that's put into place, we think about the Trail of Tears and all this. But we got to remember there was also a lot of mundane existence that took place. There was a lot of sort of regular activities that people would come to this county, maybe not really trying to speculate or get rich quick, but with the intention of settling and leading a life that perhaps they had led earlier. After all, it wasn't the gold initially that whetted Georgia's appetite for the Cherokee territory. It was land, land to expand, to grow. And so what we see, for example, is, in this case, an early form of almost a sharecropping agreement. This is 1832, but a fellow named Caldwell enters into an agreement, oops, a little, enters up here into an agreement with a, uh, uh, Lewis Ralston, whose name you see pop up all the time during this period, John Jacobs, um, and one other fellow, I can't remember. But anyway, the point is, he's going to work essentially on raising crops for which he will get room and board and a tenth of the crop. 
Now, what's interesting about this, he is not a subsistence farmer. This is not, you know, the woodsman carving out a field in the frontier and sitting down and just growing enough to feed himself and maybe trade with his neighbors when baby needs new shoes and things such as that. He really, I think, is growing for the market. You can look up here and you can see that he will um, raise the crops until they are ready um, for the marketplace. The crowd, uh, where is it? All to make on said Ralston's plantation. So maybe a considerable amount of size. I don't think they're using plantation to re represent even small farmers, but uh, small farms. But what this tells us, or reaffirms for us, is that this county, while focusing on, the, of course, the gold rush, was part of a larger market economy. Indeed, its connections were not local, but indeed spread out to a lot of parts of the South. This is also clear by the people who come here, who invest here, and the commercial relations that they have um, um, beyond uh, Lumpkin County. It also may affect how they try to shape the society to reflect this larger orientation to the world. But you can see the little things, 1832. Here he is, a guy working essentially, um, essentially on shares. Um, now, of course, economic activity in Lumpkin goes beyond simply mining. You may have saw uh, Chris's article in the Nugget, which referred to a tannery being established, what, 1841, something like that. Well, you know, you can go even earlier, uh, 1834, the state legislature charters two turnpike companies to build roads, one to Ella J and the other to Blairsville. The idea is you're opening up all this new territory and connecting with, um, with Tennessee. So this idea of expansion. So the economy was focused not simply on extracting gold and the extraction economy, it was focused on growing an economy where goods and they people. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> where goods and, 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 and people could move and settle and make the land sort of productive because clearly there was plenty of land that was not uh, a gold, um, you know, gold bearing, but just would be there for, say, farming. But one thing that we know about this type of economy, and certainly was very evident from the number of debt cases we saw, we'll see in these uh, banker boxes, but this is true larger on the South, it is a credit-based economy. Specie, coin, gold and silver, uh, which was currency, which was money at the time, is incredibly scarce, which is very ironic, considering people are, are mining gold. This was the um, means of exchange, the medium exchange, promissory notes. You see them all the time. I mean, the banker boxes are filled with these notes, some attached to the lawsuits on debt, others just loose in there. In this case, you might recognize one of the names up there, but uh, John Choice, who was a merchant, among other things. And you notice that in this case, he is given a promissory note to Wright and Bull and Company, who are merchants in Augusta. This is typical of a lot of notes that you would see because these merchants and others depended on these suppliers in places like Augusta, you know, pretty much a direct road from Augusta, but also Savannah, Charleston. And I dare say as we go through these boxes, we'll find agreements with merchants, suppliers from New York. A lot of southern merchants depended on credit and goods uh, from the north. But this is how he would pay it. Usually it's a demand <coughs> note sometimes, six months, I will pay X amount. In some cases, he doesn't pay, and he gets sued, has to do a lot of other notes. Uh, Francis Bullfinch, for example, his name comes up all the time in debt cases. It's, are they deadbeats? No. Largely what happens is that they have to depend on their customers to pay them. It's a P Peter to Paul scenario. They have to extend credit as well. Cash doesn't really exist. And so consequently you have to look to your farmer or maybe one of your neighbors who you have given credit to for the purchase of items, whatever that might be, we'll actually see a list, that they will eventually pay you. 
And if you don't, well, you might be able to stay off, stave off right and bull for a while, but eventually they are going to sue you. Debt cases make up perhaps the majority of civil litigation um, in these uh, boxes. But again, Augusta, an example of how the economy here is tied to this larger market economy that's developing um, in the 18, um, 1830s. Here's another one, promissory note, but done locally, given to the Belfast Mining Company, which was one of the first mining companies chartered when Lumpkin County uh, was established. I think 1834. This is an 1838 note. But anyway, uh, so that's more local. But this is how people dealt with one another economically. Again, not everybody could pay, and eventually people did get uh, sued. Here's an example. John Hills, who was a doctor here, who also appears a lot of times in the record suing and getting sued, usually over debt. As a physician, I ran across a few cases in which he's suing for his, his services that were rendered um, over time. But in this case, his lawyer, Alfred Harris, has just sort of reached the end of his rope. You can see from this account, uh, entries as far back as 1842, this sort of statement of account is uh, attested in 1849. So you see how long he has waited. Now, some things I'm not quite sure what's going on. I really would like to know, and if anybody out there has some thoughts, please let me know. You can see, for example, there are instances in which Harris provides legal services. Well, he's a lawyer. But look at this thing. Um, uh, to, what does that say? Well, let me find it. There was a good one in here. Oh, there we go. To making one pair of pantaloons. <laughs> Wait a minute. In between, you know, um, surgeries, is he getting out there and sewing? I, I don't know. But, you know, a little enough there that he got a, uh, he got a credit for a coat that he wanted to go to uh, one fine cloak. So, you know, you wonder what's going on. But that's why these records are so much fun because they prompt these questions. What's happening? What does this represent? You know, this is not a, just a just straightforward bill. It represents activity. It represents life. It represents a very tolerant and patient, you know, creditor. And you had to be that way at times if the economy was to work. Now, one explanation may be the fact that a lot of these debts are incurred when the country's still in a huge depression, uh, coming out of uh, beginning with the Panic of 1837. The South is not <laughs> immune, though it perhaps handled a little bit better, it was not immune from the economic um, downturn. Here's an example. This is a statement of account, and again, I find it loose in the records, but it's probably a, a part of a court case on debt. I mean, in fact, one thing I'm trying to do is pull all the relevant records to a case together so that when you look at um, this, um, you know, this collection, you will see all the records that pertain to one file, you know, one case from beginning to end, because that way they all sort of make sense. You can't really do that if you lose the, use the minute books or the docket books of the Superior Court, because those are entered chronologically as the events occur. And so you don't get the full picture. So one of the things is to pull all the relevant records together. But you notice here, of course, just it's a statement of account, um, what sort of <coughs> items the person purchased, I think this may be a merchant being supplied by another merchant giving the, um, the, the quantity of items that he would get. Um, in fact, I'll point out, I think one or two of our board members would appreciate the fact that he was able to get four gallons of whiskey at 40 cents a gallon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's better than high test and a lot cheaper, too. But anyway, $69. Now, that may not sound yeah. like much. You know, that's our cost of uh, lunch at Montalucci. But, um, <laughs> but back then, it represents some very serious money. And it's also over a period of time. But I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion that this was um, a evidence in a debt case um, in court. But it's not the fact that it's a debt case. It's of interest to me. It's the fact that looking at this, you can understand the material culture of this society, and you can start seeing maybe how people were living. Now, he may be selling this stuff, but what he sells, indeed, is still a great, uh, you know, he's obviously selling things that people buy. So this tells us a little bit about the consumer culture, the material culture that's evolving. And as you look at these things as we go through time, you can see how the society 
um, is changing as well. Uh, here's one I like, you know, one trumpet. <laughs> so, anyway, somebody wants to play some music, that's for sure. So these are great little records that you, know, you stumble across that you're not necessarily going to see in the docket books. You're not going to see it listed necessarily in the newspapers, although newspapers <coughs> might list the goods a merchant would have. But this also says, well, who's successful and who is not. <laughs> Obviously, the economy is fundamental to the county and its evolution and the development of its social structure. But we also recognize that uh, people want to bring in those institutions with which they're familiar and which also indicate a civilized life according to the value system. Now, you look at the various groups that come to this county in the 1830s, you see not only the miners and a lot of transients and a lot of people who are poor and populist, you also see a lot of folks making investments or speculating. You also see very people with substantial means settling into the county, and we might consider them like middle class, but particularly these merchants like John Choice, um, Francis Bullfinch, and others who want to stay here and want to make a, you know, a go of it. They also recognize that they have to sort of impose, you know, they want to impose their set of values on how society should operate and how it should be structured. So we see some of this growing elite, some of these up and coming, these well to do of the county, uh, start to come together to, you know, create the institutions that they recognize as a um, indicative of a stable sort of society or important to creating a stable society. And in this case, we look at religion. Now, this is a, an agreement as such, and I haven't done enough research and don't know enough about these fellows to say whether or not they were devout church goers or what. But you notice here they have agreed to contribute money. We got about $35, $40 there to build a church to be shared by the Presbyterians and by the Baptists. Now these are the dominant, these are somewhat dominant religions, although I don't know where the Methodists are. You know, Baptists and Methodists are the dominant uh, evangelical Protestant sects in, um, in the South. But I notice it's interesting that they are willing to share the building, and at the same time, if they agree to let some other group come in, we don't know who that might be, um, but it tells us, again, a lot of things. First, to some of these well-to-do people, William Martin, he's an attorney, and Lewis Ralston, we remember him, our landowner, um, A.J. Morrison, religion, a church, is an important institution within the society, and so they're willing to contribute money. Now, I don't know whatever happened. I haven't run across anything else. But this is one of those little records, you know, it's not attached to anything. It's just in this box. So when we uncover this all of a sudden, we're not really going to find it necessarily anywhere else. It gives us a sense of what's going on um, in this county and what is important to them. Now, by the fact they're building one building, it may suggest that maybe either there are not enough parishioners out there to support independent buildings or there's not enough money to go around or things such as that. But again, this might be just one little piece of a puzzle as we start putting it together that helps us understand the society a bit more. What year is this, sir? I don't think it gives, um, it gives a date. This is one of those sort of miscellaneous things um, that came about. But I think we probably could go back to find out when any church was built and we might be able to relate right, to it. It looks like the line of August something at 1838. Yeah, that's the other thing. Even though I've been reading 19th century records for a long time, I still have difficulty with, with numbers. Yeah, there's probably 38, it looks like. Other institutions, such as education, are important. Now, in 1833, the legislature, you know, chartered the Talladega, I guess it was called, um, uh, Academy. It was later rechartered in 1837 as the Dahlonega Academy, and the trustees were some of your major big muckety-mucks that are growing into leadership roles in this community. Uh, Thomas Clark, uh, Joseph Singleton, who was one of the largest uh, slaveholders uh, in the area, I think in one census he had 70 slaves. Uh, Jeremiah Payne, uh, Robert Holt, an attorney. You know, obviously well-to-do people and people who you see in a lot of leadership roles in this period. And education was indeed important. People recognized that, you know, folks needed to be educated. 
But I dare say I imagine that the Lollinger Academy, to the extent that it existed, was intended for the children of the um, well-to-do. This didn't mean that the poor were left out on, in the cold, because I came across these two invoices from teachers for teaching the children of parents who have been certified as extremely indigent. And, you know, I hope... You know, one thing I always worry about this project and what I want to do with it is I don't want to embarrass anybody because the names are associated with criminal cases or poverty or things such yeah. as that. You know, I want to be respectful of that. But this is history, and so, you know, we, we can't hide things because we do want to know who these people are. Now, these things are done by the... They, they are, show the teaching that was done in different militia districts. The militia districts were really administrative units, as opposed to simply mustering a militia. And so one thing is that, you know, eventually what I'll do is take whether the court cases or items like that, and in my digitization I want to plot these graphically so that you go online and you can click like on a militia district and things will pop up that indicate, you know, conflict, education, institutions, things such as this, and you will be able to see it as it changes over time. It's, we call it digital humanities now, and you see a number of these sites that you can go to that graphically represent changes in historical events. But here you can notice also a couple of things. The ages, large variation. Over here, this is one of my favorites over here because it shows what they're being taught. Just reading and writing. Let's see, Hugh McAfee. What, Henry Spencer? Uh, Subject? Reading, spelling, writing. That's it. Now you go, okay, well that, and, well, and also you also notice here the dates. Well, not dates, but rather days. One person here was taught maybe 30 days. Over here, um, you might have folks taught just like 46 days or things such as that. It was not constant. Obviously, they hired these teachers. Over here is an Allison Ledford. I'm not quite sure off the top of my head who this person is. But they were hired to teach, and they would get paid probably not a per diem, but certainly maybe a per unit, per person, per hour. I'm not sure. But it wasn't necessarily a fixed rate because these are submitted to the county for payment. Um, now, this is interesting for the simple reason, this is like 1837. This is interesting because, you know, the South did not have an established public school system. You had what we had called field academies, things such as this. The South's not going to put in a public school system until really after the Civil War. And indeed, you had some people who were really leery about teaching the poor because they worried they'd get the wrong ideas and it might undermine the hierarchical society that had been created um, in the South. John Berrien, one of our senators and governors, really did not like the idea of teaching the poor. Joseph Henry Lumpkin, on the other side, you know, said, no, we must teach them because it's not just learning how to read and write, it's inculcating values that support a stable, productive society. And that's paramount on the minds of these uh, growing rulers, if you will, of Lumpkin County as elsewhere. They don't want a free-for-all. They don't want um, um, a lot of Bodiness and, and uh, chaos. They want a solid, stable, orderly society. There certainly was violence, though. Now, there's been a lot of debate over the years, and uh, in fact, in many cases, the idea of the South or the Appalachian region is inherently violent, almost as a matter of culture or, um, you know, um, uh, just, just upbringing. It really has been refuted in a lot of ways. A lot of the impressions that it was a violent region was actually perpetrated by other people, you know, from outside who would look at the society and just assume uh, the worst. Or people like William Gilmore Sims, who wrote a, a novel about Guy Rivers and just made it seem like it was a lawless sort of society. Um, Merton Coulter, who wrote a book on Auraria in its first year, commented that, yeah, you know, there were fist fights, people got drunk, got carried away. But that was people letting off steam. He didn't believe that it really was this incredibly lawless society. Uh, David Williams, in his book on the gold rush, uh, looks at how some people viewed it as an ungovernable region. 
But these were people from looking from the outside in. You did have violence, though. Some of it may have been gratuitous. Some of it may have been, well, somebody had a little bit too much hooch after a game of, uh, you know, chuck a luck and uh, thought they were being cheated. But one thing I've been sort of working on and as part of my research into this and seeing these patterns in the uh, cases that I come across as I start to organize them and look at them over time is to realize that in many cases some of the violence, not all, but some of the violence actually was an expression of a local system of justice, a rough justice, if you will, usually uh, perpetrated by those who tended to be landless, tended to be poor, who were not part of um, you know, this growing leadership class in Lumpkin. It represented also in part a suspicion and a conflict with the state law, the state system that had been imposed with the creation of the county and its courts and its judges and its lawyers. Think about this. First, we all have a suspicion as Americans of centralized power, centralized government. So next thing you know, the community you've come to, maybe you came in 1829 or 1832 or maybe 1833, whatever, all of a sudden now, this distant Milledgeville capital has put in this system of law, statutes, process, legal terms. And if you're illiterate, and even if you are illiterate, you don't know what it all means. And so who rules? The lawyer, who sort of is your God, your Virgil, if you will, um, um, into exploring this world of you know, writs and fifes uh, and bonds. You don't know what they are. You don't know what's contained in there. You know, think about how alien that is. And so what you see, and it's something we find in, in history, and in archaeologists, not archaeologists, anthropologists have documented this well, is that in many cases you have a sort of local system of justice, of dispute resolution that communities will um, embrace. Because everybody wants some type of law whether it's statutory or this local justice. Everybody wants some type of law. And so what you have in some cases, what I think is occurring, is with these assaults, which people are indicted for beating somebody up, you know, the, the powers that be, those who subscribe to this state system of law, see this as just violence and, and incorrigible behavior. For the people perpetrating it, maybe it's what they're doing is they're carrying out justice that's personal and immediate and is not dependent on some strange third party, i.e. the court or the judge, over whom you have no control. Here's an example. This is 1836. 1836, Martin Lance, Elizabeth Lance, and William Lance are indicted for an 1835 assault on John uh, Sutherland, uh, in which they uh, came and... Uh, let's see, they ill-treated him, they beat him up, they bruised him. In other words, they did something to him. This is a family affair. I'm assuming they're a family, and I think they are. But they go after him, the whole family. Come on, honey, we're going to go beat up John. You know? <laughs> I mean, think about this. Well, let me get the biscuits out, all right. <laughs> think about that. They all go after this guy, and they whoop up on him. Now, is this gratuitous violence where they're all just getting liquored up or something like that and go? I don't think so. I think this was a response to what was done, that something was done that they saw as wrong, and rather than running to a lawyer or running to a courthouse and trying to get an indictment, and to get it, you would have to know, appeal to a group of people that you may have no connection to to say, hey, bring charges. They take it into their own hands. Now, this is not new. We see it in society all the time. We see it, of course, uh, William Holmes wrote a great article about the collective violence in this county in the 1890s, dealing with moonshiners and immorality, ex parte, extra legal groups went around, you know, you know attacking people they thought were uh, undermining the society. So here they're indicted. Um, I'm not quite sure how it's turned out yet. I haven't gotten to those documents yet. Um, one reason I might say that it was sort of a, a, a um, 
it was a personal thing, is that John Sutherland will be indicted for um, beating up a John Lance, so maybe another family member. And there may have been some type of food feud developing because the Lances and Sutherland both have to post appearance bonds for themselves, you know, because apparently both are all arrested at the same time, all on the same day. So you can imagine they're in the justice's court saying, well, you know, he did this or he did that, and the judge has said, well, just going to arrest everybody. But they had separate indictments, but that may be the link. We see a wrong to our family, we're going to whoop up on them. Now, Drinking, of course, uh, was typical, and it did cause fights and fusses. And it may have, in fact, though, generated once again maybe some sort of perceived wrong. This case, a fellow named James Woody, is beaten up by, oops, excuse me, beaten up by Thomas Shields, uh, Thomas uh, Green. Uh, Wilts, Roberts, Jacob, Lindsay, oh, uh, and I, I can't get the name up there. But they don't just beat them up. You can't really see down here. But they go and they throw stones at his house, and they tear his chimney down. Now, is that random violence? Is that just being juvenile? Well, maybe so, except you see that type of behavior all the time attacking, not just beating somebody up and, you know, brushing your hands off and going somewhere, but destroying the house, pulling down chimneys, or <laughs> let's see, I want to move up, or as in this case, they go into the house and they pour water on the bed. Now think about that. If you've got a mattress that's full of hay or full of feathers and you pour water on it, it's ruined. Now you say, well, that's just destroying property. But think about this symbolically. A house is your place of refuge. A house may be a means of social status. In this case, uh, it's a guy named, um, I think, Robert Ralston, along with a few others, who go in and do this. Now I don't know exactly why, but I can tell you about Robert Ralston. He was essentially a troublemaker. He was a propertyless and probably penniless. He pretty much disappears from the records that I've been looking into, um, I think around the 1840s. You see him getting indicted all the time for assault and batteries, but he's perhaps most notorious for, for the indictment that came down in 1836 for exposing his private parts on the um, courthouse square. <laughs> With the language, wait a minute, I, I gotta find this language. Bear with me. This is from the indictment. I, I wrote this thing out by hand because it was so, it was so wild. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. The language in the indictment includes this statement that he exposes the private parts in the courthouse court in a most indecent posture intending to corrupt the morals of the citizens and excite in their minds filthy, lewd, and unchaste desires and inclinations. <laughs> I know we're in a college town, but this sounds like it's a winner. <laughs> Seriously, think about this. He may have been. I mean, I would not... I would not, I would not doubt it. No, no, it doesn't. I mean, you ought to... This indictment is absolutely incredible because you read indictments for murder, for adultery, for fornication, and it's like, oh, okay. This one, they went down and said, this man's wholly devoid of any morals, religious beliefs, you know, fear of God. I mean, it's just like they were creating a person that, hey, there's no way we're not going to indict this guy. <laughs> or maybe drive him out of the county. I, I mean, tar and feather. Well, I tell you what. I'll tell you what's funny about this. The prosecuting witness—that's the person bringing the complaint—was uh, a guy named Josiah Shaw, who was a Dahlonega commissioner. So he brings the complaint. He's outraged. He's a well-to-do leader and everything. He wants a good moral society. He's also the foreman of the grand jury that indicts the guy. <laughs> And I mean, he may have been, and then of course he's a witness, he's a prosecuting witness of the case that's brought against the guy. And it was all done in a day. 
you know, I can, you know, you can imagine here's you know, Josiah stepping up. Oh, what a beautiful day! Ah, you know, and then running in, writing up an indictment, running over the courthouse, saying, "We can't handle this." So what did they do? Did they ran him out of town and put him in jail? I, I think eventually he just moved on. You know, let's face it, he, he was a troublemaker. He was penniless. You know, he probably did odd jobs. And, and, uh, that's, I think, what he did. I think he went over to Fatim or something. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. I sort of lost my place here. Well, anyway, so here Green and all uh, attacking Woody. And what I think might be a reason why they were going after this fellow, and again, this is all clear, but you start to see these connections when you put these records together. Woody is indicted for having a disorderly house, which encourages... Gaming and lewdness and drinking. This is about, this indictment charges him with having a, you know, tippling house, a disorderly house on July 5th, I think it was 1835, which was about a week after these guys had attacked his house. Two of the, wit two of the guys who attacked his house are now witnesses for the prosecution in this indictment. So what happened here? Now, if Woody had a tippling house, that means he's serving up liquor, and I can only imagine, and some of the research I've done indicates that some of these guys, you know, were not wealthy, they didn't have property and everything. They either didn't like the liquor he was serving, or maybe he cut them off, or maybe they thought he was cheating at cards, but somehow there was some wrong um, um, uh, you know, perpetrated. And so we had now here instead, you know, we're going to take revenge and off we go and we're going to tear your house down, we're going to tear your chimney down. And again, tearing down houses is nothing, it's not peculiar to this county. You go back through history, go back to ancient Greece, you'll find people who are disgruntled, who are unsatisfied, attacking people's homes. See it in the revolution here in this country as well. Uh, all right, let me move on. I'm, I don't want to belabor this point too much. Um, these cases are not just about the criminal cases that I come across. You come across divorce cases. Far more I thought I would see in the 1830s, but you do see divorce cases. You see, of course, breach of contract cases. You see a host of things. But everything, a lot of that stuff you can see in the docket books that the clerks have. But every now and then you run across these neat little things, whether it's a, trial, a witness statement, trial transcript, or in this case, these are the lawyer's notes for a closing argument in a divorce case. And maybe this is something only a lawyer like me could love, but it shows his strategy. But at the same time, it also shows you maybe opinions about people who had appeared in cases, giving a suggestion what their reputation was in um, the county. And also about some of the trans, you know, accusations that were made in the case, which would not appear in the pleadings. What's also important about things like this and those early indictments, these don't appear in the newspapers. You don't get a, you know, well, what's happened in the courthouse um, column. You might see, of course, sheriff sales. You might see some big event. But these everyday events you don't see. And so these records really are the source for understanding what's going on. Um, let's see. Let's see. The last couple of things I'll point to deal with a, a group that all the time is sort of out of mind um, in many cases, you know, and that's slaves and slavery. Lumpkin County had a fair number of slaves concentrated really in a couple of GMD, Georgia Militia Districts. As you move out in some of the outlines or in non-gold areas, you see the amount of slaves uh, um, dwindle. Um, you had a couple of big slaveholders, as I mentioned. Joseph Singleton had 70 at one point. Uh, Thomas Paine had 22. Even Harrison Riley, whose name you know, somebody might be familiar with, who uh, Kane uh, says Kane as a 15-year-old orphan to this area. You know, 1838, he's listed as having 14 slaves. Did he own them? Probably not. Probably hired them. You have uh, you come across contracts for hire of slaves, but nonetheless, he's obviously. Uh, trying to sort of move up, if you will, in social status by engaging in, um, in, in, in employing slaves. Now, a lot of records indicate that most, of, not maybe not most, but certainly a significant percentage of slaves were not involved in gold mining, but were involved in agriculture. 
we still had a big percentage um, working in the mines as well. Um, but here's some interesting things I came across. Again, this is an invoice. This is an invoice being uh, uh, the, the commissioners of Dahlonega, um, Cole, um, uh, is that Bullfinch down there, uh, Garth Rock, are saying, pay this fellow, Christopher Ryder, $10 for taking care, for his attention to a Negro man who was disabled from doing any work or to support himself. This is 1838. What gives with that? Now, again, it's not just this exists. It's the question it raises about the society. It may not be untoward for um, one person to take care of a, 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 a trusted slave, a valued um, slave. You know, that was one part of the old ideal of paternalism that you saw planters, you know, employing to argue against abolitionist attacks on slavery as cruel and inhuman. But the county is paying somebody. Now, that is, I think is really, I think it's fairly unique because the guy is disabled. Now, is he a slave? I dare say he probably is, as opposed to um, a, a free African American. But I don't know that for certain. You notice he's not identified. But it raises the question, what are they doing here? Why are they paying this? Why is, um, um, you know, how long will the care last? What is he doing for him? What happens to this person? But it suggests something more about this relationship between free and, uh, and, and slave. You also see other things, for example, um, uh, cases when people are, um, are uh, sued for beating the slaves of another unlawfully. You have uh, complaints brought into that. One thing I have come across that is, you know, can be unsettling, I suppose, to an extent, is the fact that slaves, first of all, were collateral. They provided security for this credit world we've been talking about. We know that slaves, of course, were used as labor. But what is interesting here is that in a lot of the cases that I've come across, not every time, but a lot of cases I've come across, the slaves that are being foreclosed on, you know, being seized and sold to pay debts, are women and children. Now, men, of course, are more valuable as labor, but you would wonder why does the creditor not insist on security of a male as opposed to a, f a female and small child? You see a lot of children under 10. So what is what's going on there? Might that suggest that perhaps there was a very active slave trade in this area or certainly underscore the fact that we're tied to a larger market, so if you foreclose on a woman and her child, you have other markets you can send them to to be sold. But it's a real, you see a lot of these debt cases in which it's the women and children who are being sold, uh, not the men. Then it's balanced by somebody taking care of a fellow who's disabled. Oops. Yeah. All right, I guess that's the end of it. Let me just wrap it up and say that, you know, when you look at all these boxes, literally thousands of documents, and this is a multi-year project for me, you really recognize that, God, how can I ever make any sense out of this? I don't know if there will ever be any great smoking gun discovered, if there will be any huge reinterpretation of Lumpkin County. Probably not that comes out of this. Uh, and, again, we'll never know until we've gone through all the boxes and have organized it to put it in a way that can be, so it can be reasonably interpreted. A lot of these things are mundane. There's nothing surprising, nothing really new about it. But you have to think of it not in a grand term, but think of it as a, these are just tiles. These are like little part of a mosaic. And the more you look at this and you understand what's going on, the relationships they represent, the activities they represent, the more you understand what society was like in this county and how it changed and evolved, how there was competition between people over um, values, over customs, over power. And the more you may ultimately not only understand about the county when you look at these, but maybe yourself as well. So hopefully this is, in some respects, a new gold rush. I mean, these are nuggets of information, the tiny little flake and the occasional big honking rock that really tells you so much. But collectively, they are an incredible amount of historical wealth. Thank you very much.
Any questions? Uh, I don't know if I'll answer them or I'll make something up. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Have you only done just the 1830s decade or have you done the 1920s and 1930s? We're into the 1840s. We're also re you know, working through the 1850s right now, but the, we're concentrating on breaking down the 1830s. Uh, what I want to do is, again, not only break up the documents according to year, but to cause of action. Eventually, right now we're doing civil and criminal, but eventually I want to have, for example, you'll go 1833, civil, breach of contract, debt, um, divorce, things such as this, so you can go to the specific case itself. I also will want to uh, create um, files of big cases that can have their own sort of files, so you can go right to that and examine it, because most of these cases are like one or two documents. So we're trying to break that down more in the 1830s, but at the same time go through the 40s and 50s to separate those out into just basic um, um, categories, like criminal, civil, and probate, things such as that. I, I know you haven't gotten through this Civil War era yet, but in the research that you've done, uh, have you come across anything that foreshadows that there will be uh, a separation from the Union? Not, not at this point. I, I see very few political documents coming out. It's all really more about daily life and economies. You know, every now and then, though, you do run across a, a letter that's included in there. In fact, I found, you know, they apparently had a paper shortage because they would use paper for everything. And I've run across documents where it's a legal pleading. I flip it over. It's a letter from somebody from California. <laughs> talking about how he's going to, no, he's, he wants to go to California, he wants to go to Savannah first to learn how to take pictures, and then he wants to go to California and take pictures. I mean, little things like that. But as far as the politics or, you know, rumblings of um, sectionalism, don't see much in the way of that. It's more just daily life. What about the church Indian removal in 1838, right? right? You don't see much of that. What you do see, and I almost put it up there, but... What you do see are Cherokee are involved. They're around. Uh, sometimes, much like you see slaves trading with uh, whites. Um, Francis Bullfinch got indicted for trading with a slave, you know, buying gold from him. You see uh, Cherokee sometimes involved one-on-one -on -one in a daily um, way um, with uh, Lumpkin Countyans. One thing, but one thing you'll notice in the, when you look at the pleadings, they always will say, like, well, one assault case, there was an assault on Charlie Duncan, an Indian. It's because at this time, this is where Indians are seen in racial terms, not in cultural terms. This is some, something that's been evolving over the decades. So Indian clearly states this is what this, who this person is, and we treat them accordingly. However, I have seen cases in which you know uh, whites would assault uh, an Indian, and they would get indicted for that assault and found guilty. So it's a real mixed message that comes across uh, sometimes. Uh, but clearly they're not appearing. I will say Lewis Ralston, remember our landowner there? He tried to claim that he was head of a Cherokee family because that would give him rights to 160 acres of land. And uh, I mean, it really was remarkable. I, and, uh, but anyway, it's, it's a great... You know, that's the great thing about being a law, uh, historian is you can read other people's mail and not get arrested. But uh, so you see all this sort of background come across. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank David for coming down tonight and giving us a great presentation. And I want to present him with a copy of the Chesty River of Life book. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, that's great. Appreciate that. Oh, awesome. Thank you now. All right. We've got 